there. Again, Deuteronomy 32 and 7. What we have to realize is this is a uh, song of Moses. And this is Moses speaking to the children of Israel. And he begins like this. He says this in verse 7. Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask thy father, and he will show thee, show thee thy elders, and they will tell thee. When the Most High divided the nations for their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, and he set the bound of the people according to the number of the children of Israel, for the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. You know, we have a war going on in the Middle East right now. And really, it's about whether the children of Israel have a right to be there. Well, I'm going to tell you the Bible is very, very clear that God called Abraham out of Iraq. Abraham was an Iraqi. Uh, he was called out of Iraq. He said, to a land that I will show you. He ended up in Haran. How many times we go halfway? He ended up in Haran. Now, you know, the word Haran means a dry, barren place. Many Christians will come out of the world, but then they end up in a dry, barren place. In other words, there's no real growth. There, there's no uh, real substance until they follow the plan of the Lord. And what happened is Abram finally said, come out from your, your father's house and from your kindred unto a land that I will show you. I want you to know this right now. You've got to move before you see. You can't say, I'm going to just sit here until I see it. He said, no, you have to move before you're going to see. That's right. And what Abram did is he followed the Lord, and Lot, his nephew, came with him. Now, I go back and read, leave your kindred. But anyway, uh, he brought Lot, his nephew, with him. And there became disputing between them because they weren't getting along, families. Right. Never seen any of that happen. <laughs> and they began to bicker. And finally, Abraham said, listen, he said, you need to, to choose first where you would like to go. And he went into Sodom and Gomorrah. We'll talk about that in a little while. Yeah. But what we find in, in Abram is that he was in obedience to the Lord. But you know what happened when he came to the promised land? It was, there was a famine there. A lot of people believe that if I follow the Lord, I shouldn't follow into a famine. But he did. Sometimes in life, things don't go just the way we envisioned them to be. That's right. I remember years ago, the Lord said, you'll speak to thousands. I look out here today. <laughs> but I do want you to know, I've been on radio in Africa. I've been on radio through the East Coast. I've been on radio uh, locally. Yep. And you know something? I did preach to thousands. I would rather have seen them. But you see, we envision when we get a prophecy from God, we fill in the blanks. And the blanks, many times, we fill them in wrong. But what we realize in this is that is as Abram went there and he saw that there was a famine, he went back into Egypt. And while he was there, a king saw his wife was a beautiful woman. Sarah was beautiful. And he sought to know who she was. And, and Abram said this. He said, tell, tell, her, uh, tell him that you're my sister. Now, in truth, she was his half-sister, even though she was his wife. You know, isn't that something when Christians come out of the world, but still they're doing some of the old things? Still, still there, there, you know, because of, of human nature, right? And God wants to crucify in our lives. And I'll tell you the truth now, it made uh, Pharaoh angry that he had lied to him because uh, uh, God was going to put a curse upon Pharaoh. And he said, why did you not tell me that this was your wife? He said, well, I was afraid you'd kill me. 
Many times in fear, we make decisions that are very poor decisions. When we need to learn to trust the Lord. Come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you. And I will be your God. So what did Abraham do? He goes into the promise. And that's what that's the beginning of Israel. Do you know the name Israel was born in Jacob, his grandson? There was Abram, and then there, and we understand that down through from Isaac to Jacob, and Jacob wrestled with the Lord all night long, and God said, because you've wrestled with me. I mean, oh, sometimes we need to wrestle with God. God, I just need this thing. I need this victory. I need this. What was happening in Jacob's life is that Jacob was being pursued by his brother, whom he cheated out of his birthright. Now, he didn't need to do it, but I won't go there. But, but Esau was coming to kill Jacob, and so was uh, uh, Laban, his, his, his uncle, because he somehow tricked him into giving him most of his cows, and, and his daughters, and, and Jacob runs out, and Label, Laban is ready to kill him as well. So he, he had enemies. Let me tell you, you know what the word Jacob means? It means trickster. It's like a guy that sells used cars by putting sawdust in the engine block so that it's quiet and you can't hear the knock. You know, after a while, that person is going to have a payday. After a while, that person is going to cross the wrong people. And, and they're going to be angry. Well, that's exactly where Jacob was. He got himself in a dilemma. He got himself in a fix. And he'd come to the place in his life, I can't live like this anymore. I will die. Maybe it's addiction. What might it be in your life? But the Bible said he wrestled all night long. He wrestled with Jacob, with uh, the Lord. And God said, because you've wrestled me all night, God was pleased with his wrestling. I've had people say, well, you know, I'm that. And, and, and they begin to swing at God. Let me tell you, he's got a long arm and he's patient. Go ahead and keep swinging. You'll get tired eventually. <laughs> or maybe he'll grab you by the, by, by the loin. I ain't going to say where that was, but that's beside the point. But he grabbed in a place where he paid attention. And the Bible said he brought him to his knees. Uh, it, it's, the Bible said his hip, his, his, his lower part. And there when he was on his knees, that's where the Lord said, because you have wrestled me all night, he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but it shall be called Israel. Israel was born out of the loins of Jacob. Amen. And today we know that Benjamin Netanyahu, all of those that are Jews today, have every right given by God to be there. And I think it's, 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 it's commendable to watch them come up against an enemy that there's no way they can win without the presence of God. How many know with God we can do anything? You know, when you get into the middle of a battle, sometimes it, it becomes chaotic. Things are coming from every angle. How do I, how do I quell the storm? I have to trust in Jesus Christ. And I want to go back and focus on this one verse. In verse 7 of, of, um, of Deuteronomy 22, it says, Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. You know, we got to remember the goodness of God in our lives. It's so easy to forget. It's so easy to go on in life. And here we find that God is telling them that they need to remember. The word remember in the King James uh, for in, in Deuteronomy uh, the Bible, or should I say in the Bible, 320 times the word remembrance. Remember. Remember. And I'll tell you this right now, we need to remember 
what the Lord has done. You know, the Bible says, count your blessings. Name them one by one. Look what the Lord has done. Amen. You see, what victories they are, there are. As I see young men that, that are battling and saying, look, I see a future ahead of me. I look back on that, but I've seen what the Lord is able to do. Look what he can do. He can take the weakest of the weak. I remember as a young man sitting back there and having evangelists come and speaking. And I used to look at them and admire them. And I would say to God, God, I wasn't born like that. I don't have that in me. And God said, you don't need that. You need me in you. How many know that when we learn to walk in the spirit of the Lord, God can release his anointing through a vessel that's been cracked and that's been marred? Mm -hmm. Amen. If we'll trust him. Thank you. Remember. He said, remember the land of Egypt. He said in Deuteronomy 5, 15, <coughs> excuse me. In Deuteronomy 5, 15, remember what thou hast, that thou was the servant in the land of Egypt, and that the Lord thy God brought thee out thence through a mighty, the mighty hand, and by the stretched out arm. Therefore the Lord thy God commanded thee to keep the Sabbath day. What is the Sabbath day? It is rest. How many know God wants us to rest in him? But he wants us to remember what the world was like. Because Egypt is a type of, when you look at typology, if you take any, uh, uh, college courses in theology. Typology is where God uses uh, a something as a metaphor. And what we realize is there is a literal. I'm going to tell you, there's no, there's no metaphor that isn't first literal. A lot of people get into this, uh, well, you're, you're looking at it literally. You better look at it literally. Every scripture is literal. Every scripture has meaning for exactly what it says that it is. But from that, you can get a, a metaphor or something a, a little bit deeper, but it never changes the original meaning. Let me tell you that. I've talked to people, even of recent, go to YouTube and see, oh, that wasn't literal, that is, that is uh, metaphoric, or, or, or that is something that's spiritual. It doesn't mean what it literally says. I'm going to tell you what, the Bible said, if any angel comes teaching any other gospel than you have received, he said, let them be accursed. That's right. The word of God is what the word of God is. It's literal. It's a real, literal word. But in Deuteronomy 15, 15, it says, thou shalt remember uh, that thou was a bondman in, uh, in the land of Egypt. And the Lord thy God redeemed thee. You know what the word bondman means? It means a slave. You see, the world will enslave you. You see, I can remember when I was 15 and I saw the neon lights and I saw everything. I thought the world was a big trampoline. I didn't want to be confined. I wanted to be loose. To go out into those lights and to go out into what I thought was a, 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 a playground. Only to find out that the world was full of addiction and slavery. Like the prodigal son, when he said to his father, he said, give me my inheritance, for I want to go out. And the Bible said he lived in riotous living until his money was gone. How many know your friends dissipate when your money's down? You got a lot of money. I remember a man, his name was Johnny Adams. His mother loved him so much. He lived in, in, in Gourmet. And what happened was she died. And Johnny was left with an inheritance of her money, her house. He and Johnny had a lot of friends. But you know what happened? The last time I saw Johnny, he was living on the street in Portland. He was broke. He was a miserable man. And I was sharing with him about Jesus. He said, remember me in prayer. 
I don't know what ever happened to Johnny, but I know this one thing. He had friends until all of his inheritance was gone. Well, I think of the prodigal son, and he said this. He said, in my father's house, even the servant lived better than this. I'll tell you, the world will strip you of everything you have. Years ago, when the Lord miraculously saved me, because he found me. And he saved me, and I'll tell you, one Sunday morning, Early on Sunday morning, I went out into Kennedy Park in Portland to tell somebody about Jesus. And this man that I knew in the world, his name was Tom Boothby. And I was there uh, trying to witness, and all of a sudden I saw this man staggering across the park. And he gets up to me, and I recognize him. And I said, hey, Tom. He says, that Bob? I said, yeah. I said, man, you look so good. He said, let me tell you what, whatever you have, you keep it. He said, I gave my body, I gave my money, I gave everything. And he said, and I'm sick. And I'm trying to stumble my way to find a place to lay my head. You see, that's what the world will extract out of you. The world will take from you the joy. The world will take from you the wealth. The world will strip you. And you know something, you say, well, what if I have money? Even money will not make you happy. How many rich people commit a suicide? How many Hollywood stars are hooked on drugs and alcohol? How many are living a pathetic life? I'll tell you why, because sin can extract everything out of your life. So he says to them, he said, remember. Oh, it's easy when we come into the house of the Lord for a little while and then we just forget how much we should have gratitude toward the Lord and toward his ways. See, this world will distract you. Do you remember how you felt when God delivered you from Egypt? And many of us can can remember that. Do you remember how you just loved God so much that you could not get enough of, of God and the church and the Bible? But do you know what happens? After a while, we begin to get lukewarm. And before you know it, we have excuses why we don't go to church, why we don't go to prayer, why we don't do this. Well, I'm busy. You go in the newspaper, they still do it, and they'll go back a hundred years. And you'll see so-and-so uh, uh, fighting to to be in legislature or something that, of that sort, thinking that that was important. But I'm going to tell you, if you ask that, if you could raise that person up today and ask them what is important, then I'm going to tell you, they're going to say that that is nothing in comparison to know Jesus. To know Jesus. Jesus said to them, he said, remember the loaves. In Matthew 14, Jesus fed the 5,000 men plus women and children with five loaves and two fishes. He had 12 baskets of scraps to spare. See, God can do it. And many people believe the lad with his lunch, that he had some big fish and these huge loaves of bread. I believe that the Loaves were about that big, and I believe the fish were the size of a sardine. And God could take that little portion, and he could do great things with it. How many know that God could do that in your life? Yeah. What have ye in the house? Right. He said to the woman who was about to die in a famine, he said, what have you? She said, I have a little more, a little oil and a little meal. God, and, and through uh, the prophet, God blessed that oil and that meal that it never ran out throughout the whole famine. I want you to know that God is not going to use what you don't have. He's going to use what you do have. Many of us put our lives on hold. Well, when I get to this point, or when I get to that point, this is the day the Lord has made. Are we willing today to be a spokesman? Are we willing to speak out? Are we willing to stand?
remember the Lord. Jesus reminds them, Matthew 16, 9 through 10. Do you not yet understand, neither remember the five loaves and the 5,000, how many baskets you took up, neither the seven loaves and four and uh, loaves of the 4,000, and how many baskets you took up. He told them to remember the loaves. You know something? God wants us to remember. Remember. And he says, I want you to know this, because you know, in remembering, we can then see. See, David said, I remember that God delivered me out of the hand or out of the paw of the bear and the lion. You see, in that remembrance, that equipped him to go out on the battlefield and to fight that giant. See, David already, in his mind, had already defeated him. I am more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ, my Lord. Isn't that wonderful? You see, in our mind, we can know that we've already won this battle. In Mark 6.32, it said, uh, They were astonished and doubted concerning the calming sea because they considered not the miracle of the loaves. You see, when we don't consider the miracle of salvation, the miracle that God loves us, then we won't see the miracles that God wants to set before us. You see, Jesus said, and I said that I believe it was last the week before, that he was asleep in the boat. Why? Because he found peace, Amen. even in the midst of the greatest of storms. You see, what they saw was what they perceived to be reality. But what is reality? The truth of God is reality. And Jesus slept in that truth. And when they awoke him, they said, Master, care us not that we perish. The Bible said, Jesus, get up. He spoke to the waves, and they ceased, and the winds, and they were still. And they said, what manner of man is this? And he could speak to the winds and to the waves, that they would obey him. Yeah. Yeah. Now that is literal, but it's also a metaphor in your life. What are the winds, what are the waves that trouble you today? He also said to remember Lot's wife. This one of the shortest uh, verses in the Bible in Luke 17, 32, he said, remember Lot's wife. In Luke 17, 32. What about Lot's wife? We talked about that. Lot came with Abram into a land that God would show them. And when they got into that land, uh, Abram said, you choose first. And he chose Sodom and Gomorrah. Anybody remember the stories of Sodom and Gomorrah? And the Bible said that Lot, it was so wicked in Sodom that, that Lot's spirit was vexed. And the angel of the Lord came down, two of them. And they visited Lot, and they visited his wife, and they visited his family, that even the men wanted to rape the angels. That's how wicked it got. I'm going to tell you, we're living in pretty wicked days. Yeah. 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 The Bible said, as it was in the day of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. Mm -hmm. People would be doing what it pleasures them. Mm -hmm. But what we realize in this is that he warned Lot to get out of Sodom and Gomorrah. Come out from among them. But what happened was, as they were walking out, now we don't know what happened uh, exactly to Sodom and Gomorrah, other than it was destroyed in a moment. Was it a volcanic activity? Uh, probably. But the fact of it is, he says, do not look back, but walk forward. Let me tell you what, if you're, if you're walking, you can walk about three miles an hour, maybe a little faster if you concentrate. But if you're walking backwards, you see, you're going to fall behind. And what happened is that she fell far enough behind that when that explosion came, that it literally turned her to a pillar of salt. We've seen that uh, with volcanic activity where people were close enough to where they were totally consumed 
and the statue uh, remained. That it was petrified. And what we realize is it happened because she had her eye on the world. How I many know you gotta leave the world? You gotta get out of there, and that's what he said. He said, remember Lot's wife. Another time that Jesus said, remember, in Luke 16, tells us that Lazarus and the rich man, that Lazarus died and was carried into, into paradise, but the rich man was buried, and he lifted his eyes in hell. I'm going to tell you people, there is a literal hell. And when he did, he said, he saw Father Abraham of the bosom, and this is what he said. He said, remember. This is what Abraham told him. He says, no. He said, there is a fixed gulf between you and, and, and Lazarus. In other words, when we die, there's no more repentance. The Bible said, as a tree falls, so shall it be. This is the day the Lord made. This is the day to repent. This is the day to make it right. Don't put off tomorrow what you should do today because you don't know whether tomorrow is yours. He lifted up his eyes in torment and in flame. And he called for mercy from Abram or Abraham. But Abraham said, Son, remember. When the beggar was on earth, when Lazarus was on earth, he begged and you passed him by. What we need to understand and realize in this is that now Lazarus is in heaven. I'll tell you, whatever it is you suffer in this life doesn't even compare to what is in store for those who love Jesus. Can you imagine what eternity is going to be like to be in his presence? To realize this, that, that we have a he heavenly gain and a hell to shine. You see, hell's a real place. Hell's a place, but the Bible says that God did not create hell for his children or for humans, mm -hmm. but for Satan and his angels that followed him. Mm -hmm. You see, there's only one way to go to hell, and that is to reject the gospel of Jesus Christ and reject what God can do for you. Amen. So many people, they want to skip the, the message of hell. There is a real hell, people. You know what that rich man said to Abraham? Abraham. He says, send me that I might warn my brothers right. of this dreadful place. And then let me, then I'll come back and suffer for eternity. And you know what the reply was? Though one were raised from the dead, they won't believe. Right. What's not one raised from the dead? Is this name not Jesus? Do we not focus upon him this morning? Don't we realize he's the resurrected Christ? He is the master and that we can look to him. Surely the world is in chaos. The world is in trouble. I, I could sit here this morning and tell you all kinds of things about what's going on in the world, about our banking system, about everything and, and how uh, where we're at right now. But I'm going to tell you this right now. The greatest thing is, is I know him. I trust you, Lord. I trust you. I know that you are faithful, and I know that you are true. I know that you never leave me. But you're faithful. You see, we got to realize the land of Egypt reminds us of God's deliverance from sin. The lost love reminds us and I didn't get to that one there. But when the Lord said, you've lost your first love, I see that in the church. Yeah. Do you know what an excuse is? The excuse is, is the skin of a reason. Stop doing a lie. You know, there are people that, excuses, 
as, as a teacher, you're going to hear that from your student. Uh, the dog ate my, my, my lunch, you know what I mean. You, you, you have excuses. But the fact it is, is that there is no excuse. Do we love the Lord? Do we make a decision for him? Will we walk with him? That's really what he's saying today. He said, I'll not always tarry with flesh. He said, this is the day. This is the day to make up your mind. This is the day to follow after me. This is the day to rise up. What have ye in the house? Well, pastor, I'm going to just put my life off until I get some victory. Or some. See, that's the way the devil works. Are you willing to get up? Are you willing to say, Lord, here am I? Are you willing to say, Father... Let the anointing, I'm going to tell you this now, when you will let the anointing flow from you. You see, every Sunday morning, I, I have a lot of anxiety on Sunday morning. Now, though the Bible says be anxious for nothing, but I know who I am. And I know that I'm but a mortal man. I know that I need the Holy Spirit. The Bible said without him, I can do nothing. Right. We depend so yeah. much upon the Holy Ghost. Yeah. But when people withhold until they feel, it's like saying, I won't go forward until I see. It doesn't work that way. You have to stand in faith. You've got to believe in faith. You've got to say, Lord, if I fall on my face, I'm going to trust in you. There's a lot of talent in this church. There's a lot of gifts in this church. A lot of gifts that are not being realized. And they're not being realized because we're all trying to play it safe. I don't have that privilege. I don't call it a privilege anyway. But the fact it is, on Sunday morning, I've got to get up. I've got to trust the Lord. I've got to say, God, without you, I can do nothing. Lord, I know who I am. Without you, I am weak. How do you think Moses felt when he led them out of Egypt and they come to the Red Sea? Brothers and sisters, how would you feel? And you look at that, uh, in that, that obstacle that you no way you can overcome. But what did God say? He said, what did I put in your hand? He said, you put a staff in my hand. He said, well, then use it. How can I part the waters with a staff? You can do anything. If, if God would, would, does empower you, and he will. That's right. If you're waiting until you're ready, you are being listened. You're listening to the devil. That's right. That's right now. This is the day the Lord has made. I think of another woman who, had, who, had, uh, uh, who was in in famished, and the... Uh, Elijah come to her and he said, what have you in the house? She said, I have a little oil. He said, go and borrow all the oil junk you can get. And he said, and bring them. So by faith, she went out and she borrowed, I, I, I can't remember the exact number, but there was quite a few. And she brought them. And how do you know you can limit God by how you perform? Right. Remember Hezekiah when he was told to hit, to take the the arrow and hit the ground, and he hit the ground three times, and the prophet said to him, only if you had hit the ground five times or six times, you would have totally defeated the enemy, but because you limited yourself. How many of us limit ourselves? How many of us get up and say, Lord Jesus, here am I. I am a servant of the Lord. You use me today, Father. You help me. You see, whether you're a school teacher or whatever your occupation is, you you know, you are gifted by God. I remember in the third grade, you know, we were very poor and we were young because I had a father that was an alcoholic. And I remember in the third grade, there was a teacher, a third grade teacher, and you know what? She she was a nun, but then she 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 left that to come back to civilian life. She had so much compassion. She used to bring me sweaters because she knew, she could tell we didn't have a lot. 
And you know something, there's something in that that I'll never ever forget all of my life. Is her compassion. She brought more to school than just arithmetic. Amen. But she knew who she was. Right. She knew that she was a gift, an ambassador of God, to come into her classroom and to try to help people to live a life better. Amen. You see, that's what we need in the world. We need the life of God's people to release the spirit within them. To bless those around them. Does it mean you have to be perfect? No. But it means you have to be faithful. And that is, Lord God, I will get up this morning on Sunday. Do I feel <coughs> many times on Sunday morning like I get up like Superman? Ta -da, ta -da, ta -da. You know what I mean? Yeah. Can't wait to put my suit on. A lot of times I am fearful. God, I know. I know that without you. If you feel that apprehension, that's good. That we feel that because we know who we are. We know we're but flesh. But the fact that it is, is when we allow ourselves to yield to the Spirit of the Lord, what God can do, what God can do in, uh, in you, if you would come out of your shell and stop playing it safe and stop saying, well, you know, I'll, I'll get up when, when I feel. I remember one lady, she was a great singer. And one morning I met her in the, uh, back in the beginning of the church, and I said to her, I said, so you got a special this morning? She went, I don't feel it. I think there's a song like that. Feelings. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Feelings. <laughs> When's the last time we go by feelings? Right. I am a man of faith. I believe the word is what it says that it is. David was not out there licking his finger and putting it to the wind to find out whether or not he should take on that giant. Can you imagine what kind of a world we'd live in if the pastor got up on Sunday morning and went, I won't be there this morning, I don't feel it. <laughs> How many people would have a job long if you... <laughs> but yeah, we, we accept that foolishness into the church. Are we not warriors? Yeah. Are we not here to say, Lord Jesus, I want to remember. I want to remember what you brought me out of. I want to remember, Lord God. I want to be more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ, my Lord. I want to be faithful. Mm -hmm. That's why when we look at communion, it says to they who take it worthily. It didn't say worthy. None of us are worthy. No. In fact, in the end, we'll find that with the book of life, you can say, who is able to open the book? And the Bible says they'll lament and they'll cry until Jesus stands up he and says, worthy. I'm able. Oh. Do you believe God's able in your life? Mm -hmm. Are you putting yourself on hold? I want you to know when I got saved, This is a relatively small Bible to what I went and bought. You, you see that Bible down there? I went to the bookstore and said, I want the biggest Bible. Nothing weighed 10 pounds. But I couldn't quote John 3.16. But my intentions were right. And you know what? When I went out on the street and began to tell people about Jesus, I didn't know it all. But I know this one thing. I knew him. Let's talk about Jesus. He is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. He's the Master of everything. You see, that is what God is calling us to. Would you stand with me, please?
We all have diverse gifts. He said, do all prophesy? Do all, do all uh, 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 have the gift of tongues? Do all have, uh, you know, these various gifts? He said, not all have them. But you know what? You are unique, and God has birthed you. And when you release what God has put within you, I will tell you, number one, you'll be amazed more than the people around you. But when you play it safe, you'll never know. You know that Grandma Moses was 80-some years old before she knew she could paint? Never painted anything in her life. She grabbed some paint and a brush, and she began to paint at 80 years old. You know that Colonel Sanders was 60-some years old before he knew he could cook a mean chicken. <laughs> you know why that is? It's because so often in life, we just put ourselves on hold. When God is saying it's in you, this is the day the Lord has made. If you don't know the Lord is your Savior today, you can know Him. This is the day that you can receive Him. If you need deliverance in your life, this is the day that God can and will deliver you. See, this is the day to face the giant. This is the day that the Lord has made. We don't need to put it on hold. We need to trust Him. Hallelujah. If you want prayer this morning, I'd love to pray with you. Just come forward. I'm not going to ask people to bow their head if you want prayer. Jesse, that's wonderful. Amen. Selena, others, thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Jesse's been babbling. You know what the Bible said? He suggested the battle belongs to me. <laughs> <laughs>